Yeah, it's a short straw, Sammy says. Oh, that's, of course. Well, hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. Really glad you're here. Uh, if we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I am delighted to be the teaching pastor here on this first Sunday in November. Can't believe we've made it through to November. Uh, and if you're joining us online, we, we respect your choices about your health. Please don't ever doubt how much we love you, and you guys are making good, responsible decisions, and we're glad you invited us into your home this morning. For the rest of you, uh, I guess I don't have as much respect for you at all. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, I really appreciate the sacrifice uh, that you make to support us and come and be here, uh, and, and, and it, is, it is a delight to see all of you here. Uh, that's one of the things of the three things that we hope you experience every time that you come here. If you're visiting for the first time or you've been for the 50th time, we always hope that you experience that welcoming feeling of these people who are so full of the Holy Spirit that it just oozes out of them and it's just kind of fun. Even through the masks, you could tell they're smiling. Uh, and I experienced that the first time I came to this church as a visitor and people tell me that's still there and it's because of you and we thank you for it. And we hope that you experience that if you're visiting with us. We also hope that you experience, I know today you experienced this worship, this idea of God becoming so big in our heart that we become more like him. It's, like, it's, it's almost like his expansion molds our hearts to be more like him, and it drives out other things that just don't need to be there, and you know what I'm talking about, right? The world is just occupying every thought, and God says, I just want this little piece of your heart for today, and then we'll work on that. And one of the ways we do that is the third thing that we do, which is what I, I am privileged to do, which is to open God's Word, and we go verse by verse every Sunday through God's Word. And last week, we concluded the book of James, and today we're going to start the Old Testament book of Jonah. Um, and you no know, applause for Jonah? That's, uh, you don't, don't, not for me, but boy, you'd think Jonah's... He's going to take it on the, on, on the, the, the kneecaps a little bit here. Uh, one of the first things we need to do, though, is figure out where, if you are having your Bible, where do you find Jonah? And so I hope you will forgive me. I want to condescend a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about, about your Bible. And by the way, if you are new to the Bible, then you're going to enjoy hearing a little bit about it. Some of you have heard about it since you were in the third grade. I hope you'll just forgive me as we teach people a little bit about their Bibles. And if you need a Bible... I bet you Kyle could get you one right now, and if not, we could make sure you have one before you leave, or we'll just have, have one sent to your home, okay? So, uh, and, and you, you know, it's a digital age, so some of you have your Bibles on your phone, and that's okay, as long as you're not playing, you know, words with friends or whatever. They, that dates me a little bit. That's probably 10 years old. Now it's, it's, you know, Bible crush or something like that that they got on there. So your, your Bible, through and through, is divided into two sections, an Old and a New Testament. This is the first time we've been venturing into the Old Testament. I think it's important to make sure we understand they were written by the same God, inspired by the same Holy Spirit. So differences we find in the two are going to be more of the style of revelation and not necessarily the character of God. One of the things that I want to make sure of is that none of us think that God was really mean in the Old Testament. He became, as he got older, he became nice in the New Testament. No, um, even our, I, I got I to gotta go back to James. James chapter 1, verse 17 says this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. An eternal being existing apart from time, does not change. Same God, Old Testament, same God, New Testament. And the God that shows up in the New Testament, one of the differences is that this is Jesus showing up to teach us. And that is, that marks the difference. The, the history of God dealing with his people through the point of Jesus' entrance and incarnation on the earth is the collection of inspired documents we call the Old Testament. And after that, it didn't go away. <laughs> Jesus said this as he was on the earth. He said, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And you're going to see later that that term, the law or the prophets, means the entirety of that scripture to date, the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Hmm? 
I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So what is the difference between the two? Well, again, we talked a little bit about being the style of revelation. And I think the, the Bible explains itself better than I can explain it. So let me tell you what the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 1. He said this, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. That's the Old Testament. God revealing himself to the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. And listen to this one. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, exact representation of God's being. Do you get this? This is so, so beautiful. This God that everyone, you know, you grab people on the street corners, whatever they're thinking these days, 90 plus percent of them believe in God. I think it's even more than that if they just weren't afraid to admit it. But they don't know that much about God. They don't know that God made us like fish in a fish tank and got into the tank with us and became a fish. That's Jesus. God incarnate as a human being. And that story from then on is that the New Testament. Does that make sense? It's beautiful, isn't it? Something tells me I ought to stop right there because it may go downhill. Don't, don't nod your head. That's, no, that's not the kind of encouragement I need. You're just probably right is all. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, the Old Testament, how it's structured. Again, this may be condescending for those of you who know your Bibles, but uh, the, the, the Old Testament has four big sections to it. The first five books, because there's five of them, they call that the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. These are sometimes called the books of Moses or the books of the law. And you get in there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, my favorite, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, <laughs> right? And these, these were books that were dictated by God to Moses, so you wonder, how does anybody know about the first human beings in Adam and Eve? Well, God knew about them. He knew them just like he knows you personally. He knew them. And he told Moses about it, and Moses wrote it down, and this is how we have a record of it. From then, then the history books. These are books that detail the history of God dealing with his people. Now, there's some good stories in there, too, but they give us a history. That's Joshua, Judges, Ruth. The first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Those are good stories. Esther's a great story, but it also tells the history a little bit of the Jewish people. And then after that, we get into the wisdom literature. This is what, if there were Christian fortune cookies, they'd come from this section right here. Okay? Um, you get Job, right? You never thought of Christian fortune cookies before? I think we could, I, I tell you, man, we ought to have them. Uh, Christian Proverbs cookies is what we ought to call them. Okay, we can get the Girl Scouts to sell them. Um, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. That's one that we ought to study together sometime when you have a new pastor. Um, <laughs> which it could be any time now if I keep going. And then the prophets. The prophets are the last part of the Old Testament. There are 17 books of the prophets. Before we leave this slide, I do want to tell you one thing that, that if you're new to the Bible, you may not know this yet. And if you've been studying it a while, it might, the Bible is not necessarily chronological. This throws us off as kind of Western people, Americans, uh, people from Western civilizations. Stories are told to us chronologically. And by the way, if a movie doesn't do that, it messes with us, right? You know this. You, so the Bible tells stories over and over again, and it isn't necessarily written in chronological order. There's a story about Hezekiah that's told three times in your Bible. The same event is in uh, Chronicles, it's in Kings, and it's in Isaiah or Isaiah, if you're from England. And all this is true, okay? Uh, there's another thing. Bo uh, Job may be one of the oldest events described in the Bible, and it may have been written down before Moses wrote down the books of the Bible. And the time of Job would have been about the time of Genesis. And so, you know, you have to kind of... Sometimes timelines in your Bible are really helpful to help you understand that. So I want to make sure... I don't know why. That, that threw me for a big loop when I started studying the Bible. I was like, wait a minute, I've heard that story before. Are we doing this again? Yes, we are. So these prophets, there's 17 books 
that are called the prophets. They, and they're divided into major prophets and minor prophets. And this is such a misnomer. It really only has to do with the length of the book. right? That's the reason. You've got really four really large books of prophecy. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And you'll notice that there's lamentations in there. That was thought to be written by Jeremiah, so it was like an appendix to Jeremiah. So you, it's almost like you have a Jeremiah 1 and a Jeremiah 2, and then in 1971 we had a Jeremiah that was a bullfrog. <laughs> I think it's the cold medicine, Kyle. Are you standing by? <laughs> that was 1971, right? Okay. So cognitively things are working, just it's the prefrontal cortex that's failing here. The decision as to whether you should say something or not. Okay, then the minor prophets. These were smaller scrolls. These were, well, they're Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Sounds like a soccer team, doesn't it? From a Jewish soccer team there. Okay, so... So if we now, I think you can find Jonah in your, in, your old, in your Old Testament, and I hope you learn something. If you're new to the Bible especially, this is important because it takes a while sometimes before we put all these things together and we realize what the big picture is. And if you know all this ahead of time, thank you for allowing me to condescend and to just get some things off my chest too. So we now will begin with Jonah. And Jonah goes like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Oh, this is interesting, isn't it? Now, maybe not, because my guess is that you've heard the story of Jonah before. We teach it to our kids. We teach it to our grandkids. I'll teach it to the dog next door. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of interesting elements in Jonah. It makes a good story. And uh, one of the biggest problems here is what we think we know about it. Because it's probably sometimes been a long time since we've taken a real deep mature adult look at Jonah. What is he doing? So for the next few weeks, and I don't know how long it will be, um, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting you to look at Jonah in a new way and maybe a challenging way because Jonah is not... I remember the first time I, we did Jonah, I think I was in the third grade, I colored a picture of Jonah like riding a whale, you know. Jonah's not all that nice a guy. We're going to find out. As God's prophets go, he's uh, barely makes that list. And maybe he shouldn't, and maybe I shouldn't either. And in that way, we identify with him more than any other. And I'll tell you something else. This is weird to me how many people identify with Jonah. And we can talk about that a little bit later. So I hope we learn a lot. So I guess we better dive in to our message today. Uh, no, don't, yeah, thank you. So let's dive in to Jonah. Today's message, the wrong way prophet. The wrong way prophet. And so I I'd like to give you a little background here. And I was, you know, wh where do we have any information about Jonah outside of the book of Jonah? And, you know, Jesus speaks of Jonah in the New Testament. And, I, and, and he speaks, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what. We're going to hold that. That's probably something more. We'll talk in depth about Jesus described who Jonah was and his mission. We'll probably talk about that next week, maybe another week too. There's a description of Jonah, though, before the book of Jonah in 2 Kings. 2 Kings describes in a section of uh, the king Jeroboam. Okay, and it's actually the younger. It's Jeroboam II. And in the books of history, one of the things that the, the, the Hebrew Bible did was it mentioned the king of the south and the king of the north. See, this... They came across as 12 tribes, they were one nation, and then all of a sudden it split. Just, things just weren't going so well. And there's this tribe of Judah in the south, 
and then his tribe that was still called Israel to the north. And Jonah was a prophet from the northern kingdom of Israel. And to the north, there was a group called the Assyrians, the Assyrian Empire. I think we have a map uh, that shows yeah, this large green would have been the maximum territory of the Assyrian Empire. It would have been the boundaries that they, the, like the largest boundaries they ever re reached. And I, I don't know if you can see that, but imagine if we put together the country of Syria, the country of Iraq, uh, and, and then included all of what is now Israel and a few other countries there, Jordan. That was the Assyrian Empire, okay? Now, we've mentioned a couple of places, and I want to show you where they are on this. We've mentioned Nineveh, and we've mentioned Joppa, the port city of Joppa. So you can see Nineveh. And by the way, Nineveh it has been in the news in the last 10 years. It's the city in Iraq called Mosul. And their ISIS was fighting for control of it not long ago. Interesting to me. Uh, and then Joppa is the port city from which he leaves, and, and his hometown is not far from that. So a couple of things to know about the Assyrians. Their territory wasn't always this large. It was expanding and it was contracting. And during the time of Jonah, it was in, in a little bit of flux, and we're going to see that later. Another thing about the Assyrians is that they were brutal. They had figured out that the way to defeat a country was to psych them out ahead of time. The fear of the Assyrians was what helped them conquer a lot of territory. And I'm, I won't go into details because they're just absolutely grotesque. But the Assyrians would, if an army or a people opposed them, they would do things of torture to the soldiers that were horrendous. And then they would make the people watch, and then they would do things to the people. And the word of this horror would reach other countries, and then they would have to decide, are we going to risk that by opposing them, or should we just allow them to take our country, or should we pay them some tribute? And often, people gave in to the Assyrians without a fight because the consequences were so horrendous. Okay, we need to understand that when, when God says their wickedness has reached me, these guys were seriously wicked. And, and I don't want to go into telling you how. I mean, I, it's, it's just, it's gross. During the time of Jeroboam, when Jonah was uh, being a prophet, they had been incurring on territory and they had gotten some of the northern territory from the nation of Israel. Uh, and Jonah preached to Jeroboam that they could take some of that back. So we hear about Jonah, 2 Kings chapter 14. And let me give you a little background here, verses 23 and 24. It says this, In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, right? That's the southern kingdom. They give you a reference there to help you make sure you accurately date it. It's like triangulation. Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem was the capital in Judah. Okay, so this is why Samaritans and, uh, in that legend of Samaria became such outcasts uh, later on. Okay, he became king and he reigned for 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's not a good thing. You don't want that on your tombstone. But I'll tell you something, if you study the Old Testament, I can count on one hand the number of kings, either in the northern or the southern kingdom, that this wasn't said about. Almost all of them did evil of some kind in the eyes of the Lord, and even the ones that were good still did rotten stuff. It's almost like the lesson of the kings of Israel is, wow, these were bad dudes, and I guess so am I. And that's kind of, that is kind of what we see, all right? Not good people. Uh, did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. That would have been the first Jeroboam, right, which he caused Israel to commit. So his father, Jeroboam, caused Israel to commit a whole bunch of sins. When his son comes to power, in these years that are referenced, he doesn't change any of that, and he's kind of a bad guy, okay? Verse 25, though, tells us where this is where our hero, or, or Jonah, comes in to the mix. He was the one who restored, he's talking about Jeroboam II, Jeroboam II was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, 
in accordance with the word of the Lord, of the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Goth Heifer. That's the same Jonah. They even give us the son of Amittai as the reference. So this is like one of the only extra Jonah Bible references to Jonah, other than what Jesus. Now what Jonah was predicting here, stay with me, what Jonah was predicting was the, the territory of Israel had been encroached upon. If we got a little map of that. Oh, thank goodness we got a map of that. Uh, and, and he predicted that they'd be able to restore it from all the way north in Lebo Hamath. And I think that's, that's a circled on our next slide. Um, there you go. Lebo Hamath is up there in the north. And all the way down to the Sea of Araba, and that's the Dead Sea. So all this territory, I think the last slide has it all kind of encased, all this territory could be regained. So Jonah encourages Jeroboam to go out and does do that. Jeroboam does and regains the territory of the northern kingdom at that time of Israel. And that, that sounds okay, right? Not so bad. But I'm not sure that was a smart move because there are other prophets that were prophesying at that time, and one of them was a guy named Amos. Amos has his own book, and in Amos chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, Amos kind of says, yeah, you know, I'm not so sure that was so wise. You who rejoice in the conquest of Lodibar and say, did we not take Karnaim by our own strength? For the Lord God Almighty declares, I will stir up a nation against you, O house of Israel, that will oppress you all the way from, notice, Lebo Hamath, to the valley of Arabah. So it's almost like he's specifically undoing Jonah's prophecy. And, and just to show you some maps of this so you can understand, uh, one of the places he mentions was Lodi Bar, which is just kind of on the, on the, uh, the we have the next one, yeah, just on the east side of the Jordan River. And then uh, something about the, the uh, let's see, where did he talk about the... Uh, the city, uh, did we not take Karname? And that, there's, there's, that's there, right there. So their territory is expanding, but, you know, I'm going to have somebody take it away. It's interesting to me that Amos, prophesying to the same king Jeroboam, used the same references there, north and south, the, Leb, uh, the uh, Lebo Hamath and the Sea of Araba. So wh who was right? Well, eventually the Assyrians did take back all that territory. See, this isn't a case of Jonah being wrong. He was right. You can go take that territory. Jeroboam took that territory. And then Amos said, don't be so proud of yourself. God's going to take that territory away from you. And God took that territory away. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is we, it's almost like we got dueling prophets here. And is one of them wrong? No. But maybe, maybe Jonah was a little bit more nationalistic and telling Jeroboam what he could do instead of what he should do. And that's one of the things. So believe it or not, before you ever pick up your book of Jonah, you have a reason to think, gee, I wonder, I wonder if he was just a little bit overly prideful. Uh, and, and the word, I guess, is nationalistic. So I'll leave it for you to interpret that or not. But there are some things about Jonah that we're going to read that he, that he does that kind of confirm that. Other than that, from these verses, we can't gain too much information. You know, we don't have too many clues into Jonah. It says he was the son of Amittai. Well, the word Amittai means truthful. And the word Jonah means dove. Right? Isn't that beautiful? He's a dove. Actually, you know, there are doves and there are hawks, Right? Jonah was probably more of a hawk. He was probably a little bit more in favor of going to war. He advised that. So I'm not sure he was a dove. I almost think that's sarcasm. I actually think he was more of a turkey uh, than anything. You're going to learn that. Okay? But there might be some metaphorical significance because the dove is the bird of peace and it was offered perhaps to Assyria. There are people that make a lot of that. I, I'm, like I said, I, I don't really want to put a lot of stock in that. There's something else. If you study Jonah on your own, you're bound to come across a story that he was the widow's son that Elijah restored to life. There's no biblical basis for that, but it became a legend that grew, grew up among the Israeli people, and it's still reported to this day. You can find it. Uh, it's in 1 Kings 17. Elijah goes to stay with a widow. 
her son dies, and he says, well, thank you for coming, you know, and he, so he heals the boy and restores it to her. Again, no biblical evidence for a connection here, except the timing would be right, and a lot of people began to believe that that restored boy was Jonah, okay? Again, I don't know. His hometown, Goth Heifer, um, it's, it's in Nazareth. It's actually just a little bit north of Nazareth, and it's in Galilee, and it's kind of interesting because at one point, do you remember the chief priests were saying, there aren't any prophets from Galilee? I think this, is that in, yeah, John chapter 7, verse 52. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Well, Jonah came out of Galilee and Jesus identified himself with Jonah, right? He said, it's the sign of Jonah I'm going to give them. We're going we're to study of that in coming weeks. So it is interesting that, that it's documented that he came out of Galilee. Another thing that's just, you know, tactically or logistically important is that Goth Heifer town was in a walking distance, a one day's walk, maybe half a day's walk from Joppa. So it's very possible he was sitting at home, he gets the word of the Lord, and then he goes down to Joppa. Now we should talk about one last thing here before we go verse by verse through this, and that is the style of the book of Jonah. When you hear prophetic books, those 17 prophetic books that we talked about, they are almost always focused on the word of the Lord that came to the prophet. And the the star of the show is the word of the Lord. In the background is the life of the prophet. That all reverses in Jonah. Jonah and what happens to him is actually the star of the show here. It really is the most important thing about this. And the word of the Lord is almost a background setting to the story of what happened to Jonah. Does that make sense to you? So almost all of them focus on the words that were given to them. Jonah, the focus is on what happened to Jonah. And that's, that's interesting. There's a debate among people as to whether Jonah might be a parable or not. And just to explain... Uh, Kyle and Sammy and I all believe that when you pick up your Bible, you should start with the assumption that it is real history. Because in some ways, it has to be. Uh, Jesus either was a living being who was raised from the dead, or we should all just get on a bus and go to a casino every Sunday morning. Right? I mean, that, that's it. Because this is not, what we're doing here is not good, if that's not true. What we're doing is perpetuating a lie and deluding ourselves together. So either Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead or we are among all people to be most pitied. So there are some things about your Bible that have to be true history or they invalidate themselves. But they're also parables. They're stories. Jesus used a lot of parables, right? The prodigal son is the most famous that most people know. And almost everyone doesn't really think that was a real story. It was like a, a, a parable that was told. Now, parables like, uh, I'll give you an example of one, that, you know, the boy who cried wolf, right? Boy cries wolf because he wants attention, he's bored. The entire village comes running. After a couple of times, they don't believe him anymore, and then a real wolf shows up, and he cries wolf, and nobody comes, and depending upon how mean you are, the wolf eats him, right? The point is, there doesn't have to actually be a boy, or actually be a wolf, or actually be a village for that moral to be true, right? That's a parable. But again, there are cases in the Bible that require that the dates and times of this actually really happen. So did Jonah really happen to a real guy named Jonah? We have every reason to believe there was a real guy named Jonah, or was it a parable told about him that has a moral? There's evidence on both sides. We're going to get into that a little bit more later. We know this. It tells us it was Jonah, son of Amittai. Parables don't usually quote individual people. But there are some things in it. The compression of time. The idea that it switches the word of God in its importance for what happened to Jonah. That it makes us think it might be more of a parable. So we'll we'll get into that a little bit more as we go through that. Um, So let's go ahead. We'll go verse by verse through here. So Jonah 1.1 begins with the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. If you, if I began with a fairy tale and it started with once upon a time, you'd immediately know from those words what I was telling you was a fairy tale. You wouldn't have to wait for the ogre or the princess 
to know that was a fair. The word of the Lord came to blank. That's prophecy. That phrase occurs 98 times, always in the Old Testament, and the vast majority of those are, are correlated to books of prophecy. Okay? So when we hear the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, we are not wrong in thinking this is a prophecy. This is one of the prophets. Okay? Uh, go, he says in verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Okay? God had recognized these are not good people. This is the, what they're doing is bad, and it's not lost on me. So I need you to go and preach against it. There's two action verbs there, right? Go and preach. Now, it's really interesting to me because he didn't say, I want you to go and I want you to be really nice and I want you to persuade them that I exist and that I love them. No, he says, go preach against them. You don't have to be nice to someone to preach against them. This is why, this is why I, it's, it's really difficult to understand, right? Go to Nineveh. Preach against it. You know, if, if, if Jonah really hated the Ninevites, I'd, I'd enjoy that assignment, right? If God told me, go to Washington, D.C. and preach against it, that would be fun. <laughs> nah. The only thing we know is what happened in verse 3. After hearing from God to go, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. How do we know he was running away from the Lord? It says it. He ran away from the Lord to flee from the Lord. Right? And I, look, there's some things here. Why? Look, if you want to disobey God, you can do it at home. You know that. God tells you to go uh, bring a casserole to your neighbor. You don't have to go in the opposite direction. You don't have to poison them. You just, all you do to disobey God is to sit at home. Why? Why does he run? It's, it's really kind of crazy. And it does say he paid the fare. This is interesting to me because this would have been a considerable fare. I tried to get some information on the amount, but it, it always had to do with the distance. I'm going to show you a map here. Look, I want you to get an idea for where we're going here. Jonah lives near Joppa. You see Joppa? He says, go to Nineveh. That's 550 miles. That's a pretty good jaunt. But you know what he does? It, it disobeys God, but not only, he really goes out of his way to do it. He had to sell an awful lot of what he had to buy a ticket that took him to Spain. And I don't think he speaks Spanish. <laughs> right? I mean, I want you to get that. If, I mean, if, if, you were, if you were looking at that as like an airline map that they give you, you know, to see the maps of where they're going, it would probably it would be curved because they like to do that, right? But that's, that's a huge trip. That would be like God telling me to go preach against Washington, D.C., and I end up going to Hawaii, right? Which that might make sense for me. Okay, listen, you have a disadvantage here as you're studying Jonah, probably, because you know what happens next. And because we've heard some of these things so many times before, the shock and awe value of what is going on here is lost on you a little bit. Okay, we got that? Okay. So when you hear... Someone ordered to go this way and they go the other, we should be stunned at this point. And we're not. This is like one of those verses, like when uh, uh, God tells Abraham to kill Isaac, and we go, yeah, well, God told him to kill Isaac. And then verse 10, what? This should have us all flat on our backsides to think that someone disobeyed God. So I want to help recapture that emotion for you. I have a football story to tell you. I'm hoping that it will capture this emotion which you should be feeling right now when you heard that Jonah not only disobeyed God, but he went the other way. 
True story. This is an absolutely true story. It occurred in November of 1988. I have some details here, so I'm going to have to refer to my notes carefully. It occurred in uh, Mississippi, the county of Tishomingo, Mississippi. Anybody from there? It's probably good. Uh, the Tishomingo Braves were playing the Faulkner Evil Eagles. It was in November. It was 1988. It was the final game of the season. A berth in the Mississippi State football playoffs was on the line. I do not know what division, okay? The Tishomingo, the Braves, were ahead in the game 16 to 14. Seven seconds left. They have the ball, and they're on their opposing team's 35-yard line. So they're going for a score. But there's seven seconds left. You're up 16-14. You expect him to kneel down and win the game. That's not what happened. Coach David Herbert called a timeout. And you could see the parents watching this are going absolutely crazy. This is in the early days of the steady cams that people had, you know. So there's actually a recording of this. And the people on the sidelines are going nuts as the coach called a timeout. What do you need a timeout for? Maybe it's a special formation in case somebody fumbles. I don't know. And, and it's, it's extremely animated. It took so long they got a delay of game penalty. And so the, the quarterback goes back into the huddle, and, and it gets even more animated. He's trying to tell the team something, and they don't understand. They're looking to the sidelines. They're not, they got a second delay of game penalty. And you're a parent in the stands. You're just kneeled down. What are you doing? Finally, they snap the ball. And they give it to Shane Hill, real person. Fastest kid on the Tishomingo team. Shane runs the other way, skids into the end zone with zero seconds off the clock. It's a safety. The game's tied 16 16, and they're going into overtime. Why? <laughs> this is the experience you should be having when you hear about Jonah going the other way. What are you doing? And then the kids start all pointing. It was the coach that made us do it. You know, they don't just fire kids in the South. Uh, this is not Texas, but it's still the South. And they don't just fire coaches for doing that. They were dreaming up some kind of Assyrian punishment for this coach, right? Check this out if you want. There's some actually, there's some real good human interest story behind this. I, I encourage you, and if you want to know, I'll give you the links to where you can find it. I just would like to imagine if you're a parent or a grandparent in the stands watching that game, what are they doing? That's the feeling we should have after verse 3. <laughs> why are you running from God? Why are, you, why are you disobeying God? But then you turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger in the original running man, and you're going the exact opposite direction, right? You know, maybe we're not so shocked by that. <laughs> Because so many of us have done that. I, I don't know if I should ask for a testimony here, but if I were to ask you how many times that God has told you to do something and you didn't do it, or God has called you in your life to do something and you were slow in the uptake and disobeyed, I, I know I have. Can I get some witnesses here? You look around, brothers and sisters. Thank you for being honest. The rest of you. We'll work on your honesty next week. <laughs> Do you know why this story doesn't shock us? First of all, because we've heard it so much. Second of all, because we've done it so much. We hear the story of Jonah and go, yeah, that was me. That was me. Now, fortunately, God was merciful for me, and I did not have to spend any time in the belly of any whales. But I bet if we went around the room, you could find that God has had to move all of us from going in the wrong direction, huh? Now, I'm going to conclude here for a minute, but I, I think I better tell you how this football game ended, right? Some of you out there nodding your head saying, yeah. when we last left our Tishomingo Braves, they were tied 16-16, to 16, and they intentionally gave themselves a safety to do it. They gave two points to the other team. In the very first overtime, they scored a touchdown. They won the game 22-16. to 16 parents rush the field, not to congratulate their boys, but to find out just what's the most 
horrific thing we could do to this coach and not be indicted. And they found out. In order to make the playoffs, Tishomingo had to win by four or more points. Their only chance of making the playoffs was to take that game into overtime and score a touchdown. There was no, that was, from the 35, you might say, well, they could just kick a field goal. Pro kickers would have a trouble with a 52-yard field goal, much less Division 1A Mississippi. He knew he has one chance to try and get this team to the playoffs. Something that you and I didn't know when we heard this story. He got them safety, and they made the playoffs. Does that make sense? It makes sense now, doesn't it? God always makes sense in the rearview mirror. He doesn't always make sense when we're dealing with him right now. Hmm? <laughs> well, in the end, there was a plan. And the coach knew what he was doing. Whatever happens this week, I want all of you to remember that. There is a plan, and our coach knows what he's doing. God is still in charge, and he knows how the game ends. I just hope it's one of you running the opposite direction, not me. <laughs> and how do we apply this to ourselves? Well, let's think about the times when we maybe didn't do what God told us to do. Let's think about the time when we ran in the other direction or just failed to obey him. And the times we tried to run from his presence, which you can't. And even the times when we foolishly tried to run from his arms, which we shouldn't have. Let's remember that. Let's apply that this week. Let's pray. Father, calm and still our hearts this week. Remind us that you know the end from the beginning. Uh, we may be testimonies to your love and your omnipotence. Help us today to do what we can to obey you as you tell us to do things and not run from the future because you hold the future in your hands. Lord, remind us of the times when we ran from you or were slow to obey you so we can see ourselves revealed in your word to Jonah. Remind us of what you've done for each of us and maybe, maybe how somebody might have reluctantly brought the word to us and yet thank God. God, it saved us. Teach us to obey you so that we could have that same position in heaven to stand before you, showing you the person that we brought your word to and hearing from you, well done, good and faithful servant. We ask that you do all this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.